what's going to happen later this year is uh, the inflation data, by the time we get into, say, the third quarter or, or so or past that, will be much lower. And so when the Fed looks and says that they have a 5%, say, you know, Fed funds rate um, and, you know, 2 or 3% inflation, that's going to look pretty tight. And if you think growth is really only, you know, maybe 1% or so on a real basis and slowing, um, then it's harder to justify having rates up that high. Thursday's GDP release was lower than the previous quarter, much to no one's really surprise. But the question on everyone's mind now is, is the following quarter also going to be much lower into negative territory, bringing us into a recession? That is a topic of our discussion with Sam Burns, chief strategist at Mill Street Research. We'll also be talking about earnings and the ongoing banking crisis. Sam, welcome to my show. Welcome back. Thank you for being here. Oh, thanks, David. appreciate it. Let's talk about GDP first. So not yet in negative territory. Is that in the works? Uh, I, I don't see it. I see it probably slowing down some, but uh, this was a reasonably firm report this quarter. So I would expect we'd stay out of uh, negative territory uh, for at least another quarter or so. Uh, okay. So you don't foresee a recession coming up. So let's talk about your broader economic thesis then. Set us up. Yeah, I think the economy has got a, you know, a decent amount of momentum from the consumer side, from the personal spending side, um, and, and actually a decent amount from the uh, the government, the fiscal side. Um, I think uh, you know today's numbers were uh, kind of skewed somewhat by inventories uh, dragging it down. There was a big inventory reduction. Uh, that tends to be a volatile number and will probably be reversed somewhat uh, in the next quarter or two. Um, and I think uh, the, uh, the general kind of trend has been sort of moderate growth, but not recessionary. Uh, if you look at the the numbers for the what they call the real final sales to private domestic purchasers, uh, which basically strips out the effects of trade inventories and the government spending uh that was you know reasonably positive and is still growing at a, like a one to one and a half percent year over year rate so i think that's kind of where we want to be right now actually is you know moderate growth not too high to cause inflation but also not recessionary i think that's about where we are your outlook differs well many people do agree with you but it does differ from some other people i've interviewed who share or who have a much more bearish outlook uh, for a variety of different reasons. One of them being that some people believe the stock market is overvalued to the extreme. We're still in a very bullish territory. And so this implosion of the stock markets, if you will, later this year or perhaps early next year will lead a recession. That uh, basically a collapse in the capital markets will cause a recession. Is that something you've considered? Um, well, my guess is that that will not be the cause of a recession. Uh, if a recession happens and the stocks could certainly go down, but I don't, I don't see stock as being wildly overvalued right now. Uh, I think they're relatively stable. I think corporate earnings are relatively stable right now. Um, and I don't think interest rates are going to go much higher than they are. In fact, they could come down some later in the year. So I don't really see a, a catalyst for a big uh, stock market fall, you know, crash. And I don't think that would be the driver of, uh, of a recession if, it, if one were to happen. I think it would be more uh, likely to be caused by either a sharp contraction in fiscal policy and you know, tight monetary policy or some other sort of uh, shock that, that would come along it would be a surprise. The Federal Reserve's own projections state that they think a mild recession could hit, uh, and they think it could hit by later this year. They didn't specify exactly when. Nobody knows exactly when. But they did admit that it could happen later this year, a mild recession, they said. Can you evaluate that statement? Yeah, no, I saw that, that some of the Fed staff were, were, were sort of projecting that or at least uh, opening up that as a possibility. Uh, which is interesting in light of the fact that they still seem to be, you know, pretty well aligned with raising rates again next week at their May meeting, um, on the view that inflation is still too high and they still need to slow the economy more. So I don't know how you quite square if you really think a recession is imminent that you would need to keep raising rates further. Um, that those are kind of two slightly opposing views, even potentially within the Fed. Um, so you know, my view is that inflation is actually lower than it looks in the in the data. And that the economy will is already slowing on its own, and probably doesn't really need any more help from the Fed. Um, and I think there is certainly the possibility of a recession, or at least maybe a, a quarter here or there of, of mildly negative growth. Uh, but I don't think that there will be a severe recession. And I think the uh, you know, the momentum in terms of the labor market and consumer spending is still you know sufficiently positive to avoid it in the near term. So, um, so I think, yeah, you always have to keep in mind the possibility of recession. I think spending has been slowing down a bit. Uh, January is very strong and, and the last couple of months have been a bit slower, but uh, I don't see a recession imminent. Um, and so I'd be surprised if the Fed were going to simultaneously say a recession is imminent, but also we need to raise rates. 
Uh, and that seems to be the way they're talking. So let's talk about the Federal Reserve. Now, I was reading reports that um, the spread in the secured overnight financing rate are pricing in cuts throughout later this year into next year, as many as 170 basis points. Um, so are we due for Fed rate cuts, not even a pause, but cuts later in the year? I think that's a possibility. Um, I think what's going to happen later this year is uh, the inflation data, by the time we get into, say, the third quarter or, or so or past that, will be much lower. And so when the Fed looks and says that they have a 5%, say, you know, Fed funds rate um, and, you know, 2 or 3% inflation, that's going to look pretty tight. And if you think growth is really only, you know, maybe 1% or so on a real basis and slowing, um, then it's harder to justify having rates up that high. So I could certainly see them saying that, well, we, you know, we can, you know, bring rates down some from five to 4% or maybe a little lower um, as you get towards the end of the year, or early next year, uh, simply because uh, the view of real rates, meaning rates adjusted for inflation, will look a lot different once the in reported inflation rates uh, come down over the next few months, as I, as I suspect they will. And uh, and so I think that's going to be the argument for uh, for rate cuts that we're already pretty tight right now in terms of monetary policy and, and probably don't need to stay that way uh, for too much longer. Well, Sam, uh, walk us through your thesis about uh, Fed uh, policy right now. Have uh, have they or are they going to change their stance at all in light of First Republic Bank and uh, the series of bank collapses that have happened since last we spoke about a month ago? We spoke right on the precipice of bank failures, and since then, um, as you know, many have failed. Uh, some have been consolidated. So this banking crisis, some said. Uh, some say are uh, th th these bank these bank failures have put pressure on the Federal Reserve to pause rate hikes sooner rather than later and perhaps pivot. Is that a thesis that you share? Yeah, from what it sounds like, the the Fed messaging recently has been kind of shifting in that direction, talking about how they might raise rates one more time in May, but then they'll have to watch what happens with the banking system, with the banks themselves and their balance sheets, but also in the amount of bank lending. Uh, which has already been slowing uh, from earlier high levels. And so I think if they see that bank lending is continuing to slow over the next uh, few months and that there are still some banks uh, like First Republic and possibly others that have you know, balance sheet concerns, that that will be a, a reason they can give for pausing rate hikes, certainly, um, if not starting to cut later in the year. Uh, I think they want to avoid the view that they are going to cause banks to, you know, to, to have to have problems, uh, which would then you know have, have ramifications. I think the banks uh, that have that have already had problems are, are relatively contained. They can they can handle those, but they don't want us to be seen as provoking more. And that that's the equivalent of that the banking issues that they've had are equivalent of at least one or two more rate hikes already, uh, which would then you know do their job for them in some regard. I've also heard the view that a pause in rate hikes at their next meeting. I'm not saying that they will, but let's suppose they do, or perhaps at the next meeting after May, would signal um, a lack of confidence in the economy and may even spark a further sell-off in risk assets. Is that possible? Um, I think there's a good chance they will pause. I don't see that that being viewed necessarily as a uh, a big negative for markets. I think the markets would probably view that you know relatively positively. I think they've been looking for the Fed to pause for a while now. Um, and I think, in fact, when they finally do and kind of recognize uh, the effects of the tightening they've already done, I think the markets will, will view that relatively favorably and to some degree have already priced that in. Uh, so I think that would be in more in line with what the markets are looking for. And I don't really see it as a uh, as something that would, would cause confidence to decline uh, from a market standpoint. What's the relationship between recessions and Fed policy? Historically speaking, if you look at uh, past rate cut cycles, uh, does the Fed usually uh, cut rates into a recession or during a recession or well after? Uh, typically, it's you know they start cutting once the recession is, is very visible and clear, uh, which can often be, in, at least in hindsight, you know, a decent ways into the into the recession. You know, of course, the recessions can they get defined in hindsight only after the fact. You don't know at the time necessarily that one's begun. But I think there's generally a lag between the time a recession would really start, or at least a peak in the economy, and when the Fed starts to cut rates. Um, and usually, it'll be in response to some sort of obvious either sharp deterioration in the data or some sort of event like a banking crisis or something else that would. Uh, uh, you know, clearly argued uh, for uh, some sort of monetary stimulus being required. So I think that would be probably the case here too.
we are going to talk about data, but I want to come back to uh, your, your outlook first. Uh, you know, it, it does seem that uh, based on the indicators you brought up and the fact that we're expecting a Fed pause later this year, uh, there's nothing really that's, uh, uh, that's posing as a significant headwind to the markets at this current time. Is that correct to assume? Well, I think uh, in terms of the markets, the, uh, the the kind of the setup has been that everyone is expecting much worse than what we've what we've been getting. I think uh, sentiment and sort of expectations were very very low late last year and even early this year, and uh, a lot of people were assuming we'd be in a recession already right now, and and we're not. So I think uh, and, and the same thing with earnings. I think people are assuming the corporate earnings would be much weaker than they have turned out to be. So I think a lot of it is really not that the economy is doing and you know growing at a spectacular rate or something. I think it's simply that inflation and growth have been better than people expected uh, on either side. Either inflation is not as bad as high as it expected, and the economy is holding up on a real basis better than expected. So I think that's why the markets have done better and might be able to hold up uh, certainly a while longer, uh, simply because expectations got too negative uh, for a long time and and still are in the process of adjusting to kind of where we are. And so if the Fed can avoid making any sort of further monetary policy mistakes, uh, while fiscal policy is still, you know, at least somewhat supportive uh, and more supportive than it would have been in, in past cycles, then I think we've got a chance to kind of, you know, muddle along at least and have uh, what's, what might look like a soft landing, at least for a while longer. What do you make of, what do you make of earnings so far from the tech sector, big tech companies, Alphabet, Meta? All done really well. Apple's coming on next week. You know, consumer sentiment has been declining, actually. If you take a look at the consumer sentiment index, nine-month low from the data that we got last week. And so going forward, it seems that consumers are feeling less positive, but they were spending money last quarter. That's right. That's right. And I've, I've been certainly putting more weight on uh, what people are doing uh, with their money rather than what they're saying in response to the surveys about sentiment. Sentiment has certainly been skewed kind of for a while this cycle relative to what would normally be the case in a cycle. Usually when the job market is as strong as it is, consumer sentiment is much stronger. Uh, people can still find jobs. People are still getting raises. That's normally a good situation for uh, consumer sentiment. Uh, so I think it's other things that are probably uh, driving that. I think the earnings are a reflection of both uh, relatively good top line sales growth and uh, sort of uh, a focus on costs. I think particularly for a lot of those big tech companies, some of them maybe have, have uh, you know overhired or you know were spending too much money uh, on the cost side you know, last year, or the year before, and have now started to, to really address that. And so while it's, it's brought about some layoffs and, and restructurings, I think that's helped their earnings uh, hold up uh, a lot better as they've brought you know, costs in line with revenues. I think that's generally been true uh, for a lot of other companies as well. And that's why you're seeing you know, over 80% of the companies beat their consensus estimates. And uh, what are your expectations for inflation going forward? So the latest reading down again since the previous month, we're at 5% now. Um, I was looking at um, data. The uh, the the CDs rate is almost at the same level as inflation. Not so much, uh, not yet. But it, it just you know we haven't seen inflation equal in the interest rate for a long time. And I'm just curious to get your thoughts on where inflation is headed from here. No, that's right. And, and, and certainly the reported year over year inflation rates uh, that, that you're talking about uh, are still relatively high. They, they are falling. Um, my view has been that. The, uh, the inflation data, the CPI and the PCE, things like that, are still being fairly heavily influenced and kind of skewed uh, upward by the way that housing costs and shelter costs or rent uh, is calculated in those data. Um, and it's it's not that it's incorrect uh, in the sense that it's this, they're calculating it the way they always do, uh, but it incorporates a pretty significant lag. Uh, for instance, it shows even the data today showed that housing prices or housing costs are still rising at an 8% annualized rate. Uh, when the other data from, say, Case Shiller or um, uh, Zillow or Redfin, all the other data that are more current, showing current market prices for rents or for houses, have been flat to down over the last, say, six months and are not showing any more uh, house price increases. So I think uh, a lot of the, what you're seeing in the data now is sort of a lagged view of what inflation has actually been doing and that actually inflation is somewhat lower than it looks like in the data and you'll probably start to see that uh, further over the coming months. Uh, if you strip out the shelter component of uh, the CPI, it's actually much lower over the last six to nine months uh, and would be actually below 2%. So I think uh, I think the inflation you know, big picture is actually better than it looks, uh, but I think the data is still being skewed uh, by the housing costs having moved up so fast and now moving kind of down so fast. 
Yeah, I was uh, listening to reports uh, on the news last night, and uh, CEOs were being interviewed about their costs. And it seems that uh, for a lot of people or a lot of businesses, costs are still sticky. And uh, there, there seems to be this sentiment of disappointment as people were expecting their costs to go down. So not only are, are they expecting inflation to decline, they're expecting deflation, at least from the input side. Is that something that's in the realm of possibility, just outright deflation? I think people are conflating inflation with disinflation. I mean, just because prices are growing at a slower pace, it doesn't necessarily mean that prices are coming down. But I think people are anticipating prices to come down into an economic slowdown. Is that something that could happen? No, I think you're absolutely right that uh, that there's a big difference between disinflation, uh, a lower rate of inflation, and actually deflation of prices coming down. I don't know that we'll see a lot of deflation. Um, the one place you kind of have seen that is is actually commodity prices. Uh, a lot of energy prices and, and other commodities have have really come down from where they were, say, a year ago, and uh, and have been kind of flat to down uh, over the last you know six months or so. Uh, so there are some places where you could find you know uh, outright deflation. Uh, but I think in general, you're going to have prices kind of stay elevated relative to where they were, say, pre-COVID, uh, which I think a lot of people was where they're kind of anchored in their minds of what they were used to pay, you know, pre-COVID and what they're paying now. Prices are still going to be higher. It probably would take a lot of work for them to go back down to where they were pre-COVID. But I don't think that's necessary. I think all that really is necessary is for the inflation rate to come back down. And that's already happening. Uh, and so I think... Um, People will probably just, you know, they'll adjust eventually to the to the level of prices as once the rate of change uh, slows down. Well, let's talk about sector allocation now. Let's start with energy. I like to talk about energy first. So people often say that energy is a good sector to invest in during uh, an economic slowdown or perhaps going into an economic slowdown as the demand for energy is inelastic for everybody. However, we're seeing, like you said, commodities go down, energy in particular. Crude oil has come down, natural gas has crashed. So how do you view the energy sector in light of all these factors? Yeah, so for me, the energy sector, the stocks you know that, that produce you know oil and gas and things like that, uh, I've been underweight them in my uh, sector allocations for for some time, and still am. Uh, I don't think I think the demand side for a lot of those commodities is what the reason we're seeing the commodities come down. I think it's relatively uh, weak overall, uh, partly just because growth is is in fact slowing, and there's there's actually been an increase in production for a lot of those things over the last year. And uh, because, of course, the shift away from fossil fuels, um, this, this is sort of a longer term ongoing thing, is, is, is weakening demand on a structural basis for traditional fossil fuel you know, based oil and gas companies. So uh, I would tend to sort of stay away from those, particularly. And if you do think a recession is coming, uh, oil demand will probably slide even further. Um, now, you think like utilities um, would be more of a defensive area that would hold up probably better uh, in a recession if you think one is coming. Um, they're, the risk to utilities would be more that they're exposed to interest rates. They have to borrow a lot of money um, and that there's not really a lot of growth in demand for utilities, uh, but it is more stable. Uh, so I'm, I'm more tilted toward the kind of the growth sectors, technology, communication services, as well as some of the industrials and consumer stocks now. I'm, I've still got a little bit more of a pro-cyclical and pro-growth uh, tilt uh, because I don't think the economy is, is going to be in recession right away. And certainly the earnings estimate revisions that I look at are aligned that way. The analysts are still, uh, you know, raising their estimates more uh, in the cyclical sectors, at least, um, versus the defensive sectors. And so I think that's a a pretty good sign, at least for the next few months, uh, that we're, we're probably not aligned for a recession and really defensive uh, sector positioning uh, right now. What uh, sectors do you like the most then? So I'm most overweight in uh, industrials, uh, technology, and uh, consumer discretionary right now. Uh, I've also got some overweight in communication services. So some of those big tech uh, growth names that have been reporting good earnings lately are in the sectors that uh, that I've I've liked. I've been uh, moving um, moved to neutral and financials a month or two ago, and uh, really more of the banks is the problem there. There are some uh, financials outside of banks that are actually doing okay, um, insurance companies, things like that. Um, and so I think you have to be you know a little bit more uh, selective within sectors in some cases uh, as opposed to buying just the whole broad sector. But uh, I am seeing still evidence that some of the cyclical areas, uh, like industrials and consumer stocks, uh, are, are seeing some tailwinds, uh, partly from lower energy costs and partly from uh, you know persistent demand. So I think there's uh, again a, a less negative view of the economy that's coming through from the bottom up uh, stock uh, work that I do, uh, along with the top down views. Do you look at valuations of the overall index uh, as an indicator for anything? 
uh, the S&P 500 PE ratio has come down from its peak uh, post-pandemic, uh, but it's still high on a historical basis. Is that a concern for you or not really? Uh, I don't look at it as a major concern right now. Um, I think it's you know probably 17, 18 times uh, consensus expected earnings right now. And um, that's you know probably on the upper end of the range it was in pre-COVID. Um, that it was an extra, extraordinarily high PE ratio, even if you exclude the the the, the high readings that, that, were, that we saw in 2021. But I think um, a lot of that is related to the fact that um, you know if you think that a three and a half percent ten-year Treasury yield is really the kind of the competition to some degree, then stocks still don't look particularly expensive relative to the alternatives in in longer term bonds. And I think that's the way a lot of people you know kind of look at it is that. Um, stocks are not cheap, but they're also um, bonds are not particularly cheap either. And so I think uh, when you, if you're going to allocate to something, uh, stocks look still relatively good. And if earnings hold up, I think stock multiples can hold up as well. I'd like to give you some bear cases and just you know evaluate whether or not they're even likely. Uh, so I've heard uh, you know on the extreme 50, even perhaps 70 percent uh, stock market declines from current levels. Now, if we were to reverse engineer that result such that you know let's assume they happen, what needs to happen in the economy or in the capital markets for those results to take place? Yeah, I mean that would be a, certainly a very big move and not one that I'm anticipating. Um, I guess it would take some combination of uh, a severe um drop off in earnings and as drop off in, in investor risk appetite you know for some reason so my guess it would take some sort of shock either the banking system uh is much weaker than everyone thinks it is and really starts to fall apart again as what happened sort of in 2008 or uh there's some sort of global shock uh whether it be war um that breaks out somewhere uh or another shock uh in the form of you know energy or a health shock uh, a new a new pandemic or something like that. Um, but it's hard to see something that would drive stocks down to that degree um, without a major sort of global uh, shock of, of some kind, either a, a health shock or a you know a war type shock uh, or something like that uh, because it's been very rare to see that that magnitude of a decline um, and without some sort of shock like that. Mm. So you would need a systemic black swan, Esque shock for a for a for a decline like that. We're not just because one of the arguments is that we're just over levered uh, financially, and uh, and you know if you take a look at government debt levels, for example, the dub, the bubble is just about to burst at some point. Is kind of the argument that I've heard. Um, no one really knows exactly when or why, but uh, you know that is that is one view that without any sort of shock, the system is due for a pullback. Um, but you disagree. Yeah, I mean, typically to get those kind of declines, something has to sort of happen. It doesn't just sort of stumble into it on all on its own. And you know, the worries about government debt, federal U.S. Treasury, federal government debt, I think, are you know, are probably overblown in the sense that um, that that's not likely to be a reason for uh, a crisis or or sort of a, a bubble. And like I said, I don't think stocks are in evaluation territory that would I would consider a bubble or sort of wildly excessive. Uh, certainly not nothing like say two, in the year 1999, 2000, uh, where we had really extreme valuations uh, that that would argue for a, a really big decline even without a, a major recession, uh, which is what happened then is that we had a recession, but it wasn't that actually that extreme, but stocks were so overvalued that they had to fall a lot uh, from those levels. I really don't see that uh, being the case now based on what we know about uh, the fundamentals. Um, corporate debt and personal, you know, household debt, you know, are somewhat elevated, but are really not that extreme relative to, uh, you know, revenues and earnings and uh, and things like that and assets. So um, again, without a real shock to the system, uh, I don't see that as being sort of overlevered or over, you know, in a bubble situation uh, to the extent that it would sort of fall apart all in, all by itself. Uh, which I think it sounds like what you're what you're saying. Yeah, I attended a uh, CFA uh, event um, several years back, and Jenna Yellen was a keynote speaker. And I, I remember this quote: she said that um, recessions or economic slowdowns are caused by two things: financial imbalances and the Fed. <laughs> Do you agree? Uh, I mean, often that's the case. I mean, the Fed, I think, um, has well, we'll call it a mixed record in terms of whether it's really 
uh, reducing the volatility of markets or the economy or uh, causing more volatility. Um, I think they probably try to do too much with uh, with the policy tools that they have in terms of moving interest rates around and, and, and their balance sheet. Um, I think in some cases it winds up being um, you know, pro-cyclical rather than anti-cyclical. And so um, I think there's definitely been cases where the Fed has, uh, you know, tightened, over-tightened and caused a recession and then, you know, uh, overstimulated, which then causes uh, financial conditions to become imbalanced. Um, and so I think if they kind of did a bit less and, and, and were, you know, moved, you know, rates and their policy around uh, in a less volatile way, that they would probably have better luck in the long run. Um, so uh, I think that is one of, one of the risks right now is simply that the Fed has tightened too much already or will continue to tighten too much and that that's what causes the, the next recession and the next you know bear market. Uh, I don't know where we're at that point yet, um, but it, it, it would be the, the, the risk there. I think in this case, it would be the risk if fiscal policy is also tight along with monetary policy. Um, and that's what's happened in the past as well. And I, I don't see it right now, but it could happen given where the politics are at the moment. Mm -hmm. Finally, let's talk about the dollar. I'm um, seeing the terms dollar collapse a lot in the news. It's just been making headlines. And certainly that's correlated with the decline in the DXY over the last two months. Where do you see the dollar headed? Are we due for a crash collapse? You know, these are sensational words that get people to click. Let's evaluate it. No, you're right. It's certainly doom and gloom sells a lot better than uh, saying everything will be okay. Um, but I think, um, yeah, the dollar's weekend, you know, had, had obviously had a huge run uh, in 21 and 22, uh, both a combination of, of the Fed's raising rates faster than everybody else did and, and people wanting a safe uh, currency to go into. Uh, that's been reversing over the last few months. Uh, the euro certainly has done better. I think a lot of people thought the European economy was going to really fall apart completely. Uh, and it hasn't. Uh, it's managed to muddle through uh, the war in Ukraine and the, the energy crisis. Um, they're still having issues with inflation and uh, things are not great there, but they're much better than people assume that they would be. And I think that's been reflected in the uh, the rise in the euro, which of course means weakness in the dollar. Um, so I think to the extent that the dollar is weakening because um, investors are a little more confident and willing to own uh, you know other currencies, uh, that's actually you know in some ways a good sign. Uh, I don't really see the dollar collapsing or uh, you know. Uh, people moving out of the dollar in a really aggressive way, simply because there isn't a good alternative to the dollar right now uh, in terms of global you know, money flows for, for the big money. And uh, I think that you know, rates are still relatively high in the US and therefore attractive uh, for global investors. Uh, you know, rates are still higher in the US than in Europe. So um, I think you know, the dollar could weaken somewhat further, but I don't see it falling apart or crashing uh, again without some sort of a, a shock. Uh, I think that there's um, you know, a lot of like that kind of talk, but I don't see really what's going to drive it or where you're going to go if you get out of dollars. So we are. So yeah. So you you do see the dollar weakening a little bit further in the in the short to intermediate term. Is that primarily due to uh, policy differentials between the Fed and its peers around the world? Um, yeah, I think that as other other countries have been raising rates and kind of catching up with where the US, the Fed has been in terms of interest rate policy, that's removed one of the reasons why the dollar was so strong before and, and put it somewhat into uh, reverse. And then again, I think it's partly uh, also investors being willing to, to move you know, money out of US uh, assets and into to Europe or uh, you know other markets that uh, maybe offer somewhat better returns, but are maybe somewhat higher risk. So again, it, it seems to me as, as a measure of uh, a positive measure of risk appetite if people are willing to buy uh, other currencies other than the dollar. Um, but I don't think that that's going to be a reason for the dollar to fall apart. I think it's more a matter of uh, the the big interest rate differentials that drove the dollar up before have kind of been reduced. And, uh, and the, you know, people might be expecting rate cuts later this year from the Fed. That would reduce demand for the dollar somewhat. And I think willingness to own uh, other uh, assets is helping uh, the dollar weaken a little bit and other currencies get stronger. Yeah, and I think we do have to put things into perspective. If you just zoom out on the DXY chart, we're at 101.57 today. Uh, the last time it was this high was 2016. And then before that, it was early 2000s. So, um, you know, seven-year high yeah. and then 20-year high. Right, so, yeah. right, right. Yeah, people were complaining last year because the dollar was too strong. So... You know, now it's 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 less strong. So I think it's as long as it's relatively stable in a range, that's really the ideal scenario that you that you want. 
All right. Well, thanks for your insights today. I really appreciate it. And uh, before we take off, Sam, where can people learn more about your work and read about your analysis? Oh, sure. Yeah. So the my website is uh, millstreetresearch.com. And there's uh, lots of information there about the work that I do, sample reports. I have a blog that I update there uh, that you can check out. And then I uh, uh, post on Twitter and on LinkedIn uh, reasonably often, uh, posting comments about the macro outlook. So people want to get a, a feel for what I'm, I'm doing, I can follow me there as well. Do you ever get hate mail from the market bears? Just curious. Uh, not too much. Uh, I, I do hear from from bearish people sometimes, and, uh, and and they are surprised that I'm not as negative as they are. Uh, but I, I try to look at the data. I have models and indicators that I've used for a long time and and really can rely on those. And right now, they're just not telling me to be bearish. So I'm going to stick with the indicators that I that I know and rely on. And uh, and that's what I, that's what I go with. All right. Well, I'll, I'll put a link in the description down below to uh, to your work and to your Twitter. And uh, also to those people wanting a bearish view, I'll put a link to another interview I've done with a bear, but um, just to get a different perspective. But Sam, I appreciate your insights. Thank you for coming on today. Thanks very much. Thank you for watching the David Lynn Report. Stay tuned for more and don't forget to subscribe.